We are now going to go on with our presentation for the evening. All right. We have our own special guest, John Rucola, who is the master, the master of bonangers. And he's giving us a presentation he entitles The Tale of Two Radios. I, I'm not sure where I've heard that. I've heard that before. The Tale of Two. I guess it was originally two radios, I guess. Yes. Okay. So, this is the RCA AR 88 versus the Halicraft XS 28. Okay, now, this is a big problem. A lot of people here will have, will be in one corner or the other, but John will straighten you out as to what the best, the best phone anchor receiver is. So how about a round of applause for John Rupolo, master. Very little selectivity is always a big thing to try to cut the bandwidth 
receiver down to uh, sort of take away stations that are close in frequency and might be interfering with the one to one. Um, higher sensitivity. Um, although, a good, again, a good home radio might do about as well. Band spread tuning, which is basically slow motion or fine tuning to aid <laughs> in the reception of weak stations. And, and an antenna trimmer, which is, uh, where is it? And so, like if we, uh, we turn the back on, it would be a whole lot of different. We'll put it on the AM broadcast panel. Anyway, you've got basically an antenna trimmer to kind of tune the, the front end of the receiver to whatever the antenna is. And of course, the ever popular S meter, signal strength meter. It's desirable to be able to measure the relative strength of incoming signals, and, and you may also be required as part of your job to provide reports. So, that's kind of the basics and, uh, and uh, I'm not very good demo to start out with, but anyway. There's a peak right there. And uh, picking up uh, foreign languages, just like it did during the war. <laughs> um, so in 1935, RCA introduced something called the AR-60, which was heavily advertised in ham radio magazines for $495. And I don't know who in Blazes had $495 in 1935, but military, you know, commercial concerns did it. We had one at the last uh, J&D auction, in fact. It was just a beautifully made radio. Um, I can show you a picture of it. Why I bring this up is because it's the predecessor to this guy. It's actually, I think, kind of overbuilt. But uh, you won't get all that much out of this picture. But there it is. It's, it's big, it's huge, it's even crazier looking than the um, AR-88. Um, we had one at the last um, auction and it went for pretty big bucks. Uh, so, the, uh, you know, the RCA wanted to build another deluxe um, receiver, and we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. So about 1940, the most prominent shortwave manufacturers were National Radio of Walden, Massachusetts. And I know some of you have heard of these, so, and some have it. Uh, Hammerlin Manufacturing in New York City and Howell Crafters of Chicago. Of course, RCA held the Superhead patents and was one of the dominant home entertainment electronics manufacturers as well as studio and broadcast equipment. In fact, these are the same knobs that they would use on a lot of their studio uh, gear. They also produced a long line of quality communications receivers, although sales appear to be smaller than those of the big three shortwave receiver manufacturers that I mentioned above. RCA was a huge electronics manufacturing company with a broad product line. So communications receivers were not their bread and butter, like they were for Hammerlin National Telegraphers. For those three, that's kind of how they made their living. RCA made some good receivers, but they also did, you know, lots of other things. So whether they had their eye on military or government contracts or just wanted to design and market, you know, top-of-the-line receiver is not clear. 1939, they introduced the AR-77, a medium price receiver, $139. A 10 tube receiver, roughly equivalent in design to what the, um, the other guys were making. Certainly a much more modern and affordable receiver than the $495 AR60. Um, I can show you very quickly. I didn't want to have to drag that in here too, along with all of this stuff, but let's just take a quick look at that. Just so we can. Oops. And I, I timed this presentation, folks, in case you're wondering. It's only like 20, 22 minutes. So don't, uh, there it is. Very cool Art Deco receiver. Seldom seen. Um, uh, and our, if our Canadian friend, Dan Gervais, is out there, the real Canadian Air Force also made a version of that, uh, as well as this. So, enough with the ad limit. Okay. In 1940, they introduced the AR 88. The retail price, if there ever was one, is unknown because unlike the AR-77, it was not advertised in the usual hand or electronics magazines, at least as far as I know. RCA also used these internally for their radio marine ship-to-shore radiogram business. They used a lot of these for internal applications. Thousands of these were sent to uh, 
Great Britain and the Soviet Union under lend lease for use during the war. The British used the AR-88 for copying German Enigma code traffic, which was then decoded at Bletchley Park. Um, the AR-88 makes a cameo appearance in the movie The Imitation Game. I don't know if you've seen that movie. It was a fascinating movie about the, uh, the decoding of this. Somebody needed to get the, you know, the coded traffic off the air. Now, it wasn't being decoded, but they needed to code, you know, copy. They needed skilled operators to copy the five-letter code groups, and then that got sent to Bletchley Park and decoded on the Missouri, you know, computers, the whole um, auditorium thing. Um, so this was designed to be very stable, and uh, meaning that once tuned to a frequency after a little bit of a warm-up period, it would not drift or change frequency. And I, I can attest to that. I had it set to CHU Canada, that time station. And, you know, I turned it on the next day cold, and it was right there. So that's, you know, that's really nice. I mean, we take that for granted today, but that's not something you can take for granted with receivers of this. Um, it's also, these are also well shielded so that multiple receivers can be used in the same room without interfering with each other. So it's if one person's tuning, you're not picking up the local oscillator over there and causing you know, um, And stop me if you have any questions. Of course, there'll be time for questions and discussion at the end. I just should have said that. Uh, the Great Book Communications Receivers by Raymond S. Moore. This is the fourth edition, fourth of four. Here he is on the back with his, with his lovely wife and, and an antenna very similar to the excellent one that Tom Provost made uh, for our uh, That's a gift. Uh, a little plug there. Um, anyway, um, where was I here? Oh, uh, they, they originally apparently intended this to be a top-of-the-line hand receiver, but it's just too well-built and too much of a leap from the AR-77 and would just not have been affordable. I mean, this would have been five, six hundred bucks, maybe more at the time. Um, I, I have to believe it was designed as a commercial military receiver, even if it didn't start out that way. Um, a curious omission for reasons known only to RCA engineers, the AR-88 lacks a front panel crystal phasing control. Uh, I wonder why. RCA must have realized their mistake because on the subsequent CR-88 model, they added it down here. It's a little triangle of knobs, AF gain, RF gain, and crystal phasing. So they, they, uh, the, the two receivers are virtually the same, except it's got a gray front panel and it's got that extra knob. So, Let's talk about this guy for a minute, or two. Calcraft was also wanted to build a deluxe. <laughs> Still works. Uh, receiver to, as a follow up to their SX25 receivers. The SX28 was a full featured receiver with two RF stages uh, and uh, two IF stages and push pull 6V6 audio output. The SX-28 was built using commercially available components, and under the chassis, it looks like a very fancy home receiver. Actually, under the chassis, it looks like 10 pounds of manure in a five-pound bag, and we'll, we'll take a look at that shortly. We're going we're to put these on their side so you can take a look under it. Feature for feature, it has everything the AR-88 has, plus those pushable 6v6s. But unlike the AR-88, the SX-28 was built to a price point, and compromises were made, as we shall see when we take a look at the chassis. Most SX-28 components, the coils, the IF transformers, etc., are about the same quality as you'd expect in a higher-end home console radio. Unlike the AR-88, the SX-28 was intended for hand in short-range listener use, um, and was advertised retail. Real quick, we'll go through the two lineups. I know most of you, you know, can't wait for this part, so um, let's see. Two 6SG7 RF, uh, 6SG7 RF stages, 6SA7 mixer, 6J5 oscillator, three 6SG7 IF stages, a 6H6 detector at ABC, another 6H6 for the noise limiter, 6J5 BFO, 6J7 first audio amp, 6K6, a single 6K6 audio output, and it sounds great. I don't know how, exactly how they did it. They used feedback, but the audio from this is excellent. Uh, far better than you would expect from a single 6K6. 6 5Y3 rectifier and uh, a voltage regulator, VR150 voltage regulator tube. Voltage regulator is something the SX28 lacks. 
14 tubes total. Okay, SX28. Uh, 6AB7 first RF amp, 6SK7 second RF amp. Not entirely clear to me why um, our crafters use two different tubes, types of tubes there. They have something to do with the ABC or whatever. Uh, I, I have to dig into that more. 6SA7 mixer. Another 6SA7 is the oscillator. Kind of a curious choice for an oscillator tube. Kind of great converter tube, but maybe they got a deal on them. They got a bunch of them. 6L7 first IF noise limiter, that's a pento and a diode to us. 6SK7 second IF amp, 6B8 detector and meter amp, 6B8 ABC amp, 6AB7 noise amp. They were doing some fancy ABC and noise limiting in this, but we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. It uh, doesn't seem to work right in this set, the ABC, but. Uh, 686 noise and rectifier, 6J5 BFO, same as that. 6SC7 first audio and phase inverter because it is um, it has push pull audio output. So two 6V6s and a 5Z3 rectifier. It has a huskier rectifier too because it's got push pull audio. So 15 tubes total over here. Um, the 6SG7 used by the AR88 in its RF and audio amplifier stages is a higher gain tube than the 6SK7 and 6L7. Yeah, it's, that's, that's a much hotter tube, but I think that's one of the keys to this. Other than its marvelous construction, that's one of the keys to this. The 8 of 8, as I said, the 8 or 80, it has voltage regulation, which is 28 lakhs, and it's something that any good communication receiver built after the war had, any medium to high price. Um, I think we'll, we'll skip a couple things here. Okay. The 88 has, additional, has an additional IF stage, theoretically resulting in better selectivity and perhaps sensitivity. <clears throat> Differences. The 28 has band spread tuning, push-pull audio output, and a crystal phasing control. The 88 has none of these. However, push-pull audio wasn't really necessary for serious military and commercial applications. Most people would have headphones on anyway. Um, uh, and if you push it, the 88 has plenty of audio and it sounds really good. The 88 tuned so smoothly that band spread uh, tuning was apparently deemed unnecessary. Well, they have sort of a band spread logging scale here. You'll notice you see you've got a main tuning knob here and a band spread tuning knob here, which you only have tuning here. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, the, the uh, what was I say? oh, yes, the uh, strangely, and I think this is a Questionable omission. The 88 has no AC line fuse. Hmm. I'm not sure that was, uh, you know, better equipment by this time it was generally fused. Um, that has a fuse. Uh, the, tw the 28, the AR88 goes from about 500 kilohertz to 32 megahertz, which is typical of communication receivers. What's interesting is the SX28. If you believe Halicrafters, goes all the way up to uh, 43 megahertz. I wouldn't expect great performance there, and there wasn't back then. There wasn't much going on in that region anyway. But you know, uh, oh, I have a note here. Turn receivers over. So let's do that. Hopefully, let's not electrocute ourselves. Um, Halicrafters very thoughtfully has the exposed um, AC for the on-off control up here. And you can get you can get nibbled by that if you're you know ask me how I know. Um, I was putting the new S meter in. I didn't even have it turned on, but I had it plugged in. So uh, look at all those dicky caps. So wonder if the thing works at all. Seriously, um, Joe Connor, one of our members, uh, recapped this before donating it. He doesn't remember recapping it. I think I would. If I did. Do you do your RF? Uh, yes. Um, this is notoriously hard to do in here. You can see all the caps, in, and remember, you're seeing it with miniature, with small modern capacitors in it. You can imagine when this had all big paper caps, what a, um, and the, the electrolytics sort of clamped in here. This is, it's got to the, the reverb tank school of electrolytic capacitor. Uh, so that's kind of what it looks like underneath. It looks kind of like a, uh, yeah, it's a little, little cramped under there, and that, that's, uh, so every, everybody happy so far? Are you advertising the sex? 
do they actually spec the sensitivity and selectivity, or they just say it's true? Can you take me into that there, please? Do they give actual numbers? Yeah, I, you know, I don't have to think of But they, they will do that. Yeah, I, I, I didn't want to get into a knockdown track, but yeah, they, you know, I, I suspect, I suspect, you know, of course, they could also lie. But that's what I meant, yeah. Um, I suspect, spec wise, they were probably as well. <clears throat> I, I think there are some sensitive. Let's get this guy out of the way for the moment. Always turn towards the power transfer, you know, that's like that. Yeah, tell them how much these things weigh, John. This guy in his cabinet weighs 98 pounds. <laughs> I did not, as you see, I did not bring the cabinet because um, I also didn't want to take off the 243 screws that are, well, I'm exaggerating, but that are holding this stuff on so you can get a, a better look at the, at the RF deck. Just real quick, because it is, I lost the, oh, here. I'll show you a picture. Oh, here we hear some uh, selectivity curves in there. So we do have some sensitivity and selectivity data. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll do a follow up on, on these two, but I guarantee you it will be a, a PowerPoint presentation so I don't have to drag them back in here. But anyway, it is, it is really, uh, if you want, you can pass that around. It's much cleaner under there. With, uh, and uh, there's also more room. John, were they paper caps? Uh, not in this. It's, uh, thank you for the As you can see, the so called bathtubs, I don't know if these have been recapped or not. One thing I want to note I have never seen an as is AR88 or CR88 not work. An as is unit. Yeah, that says a lot. That says a lot after it's The very first one I got at the Sussex Hand Fest in the early 90s was an AR88. Water had dripped, not that I feel about it, but anyway, water had dripped in one, in one particular spot and ruined all the pins on the 6SG7 turned green. I took it out, I cleaned the socket, I threw it out, I plugged in another 6SG7, off it went. Made fun. You know, I have no filter. Really? Well, I have that's a lot. Mm -hmm. The filter capacitor, I, I have, or I have a store, I have a drip tray over there because it's losing its oil. That PCB kind of stuff? I don't think it is. I think it's the organic stuff. Maybe you can sue somebody. That's why. Yes. <laughs> That's why it's not working. Oh, well, yeah, the one that I donated to Sarnoff had a cat tacked on under here somewhere that the mice chewed on. So I, don't, I guess Jonathan Allen dealt with that. Um, as we said, um, and I, you know, again, I didn't want to take off the table. The SX-28, as I said, suffers from 10 pounds of you-know-what in a 5-pound bag over here. There's lots of stuff. Well, and it makes it kind of hard to service. Um, and, but it's, somebody was very intrepid and did yeoman work there. The, the RF section, which is this far in here, is notoriously hard to recap. Howard has made some improvements in here that I think were more for ease of assembly than serviceability, and that's the SX-28A. This is an SX-28. It's not a um, But that originally was paper caps. Oh yeah, all paper caps. Um, I almost, it was just too much stuff to bring. I almost brought Daniel Gervais's the one that he's going to get, that's dirty and unrestored, just so you can look underneath and, and be, but it was, you know. That's not intended for single side man. No. Oh, I, uh, I, maybe I missed that. I had, I had a note on that. The single side man didn't become important yeah. until after the war. Yeah. I was trying to pick it up before I had the BFO on. The BFO on the injection in this, I think, is a little low, but mm. I had a real strong side band station and I wasn't able to quite copy my, you know. But. John, I think it's got so much gain on it that, that, that is probably drowning out the GFO. I don't know if they're, I'm not familiar with the radio if you somehow take the gain down. And make yeah, I, I thought about backing the RF gain off, and like this was just a little while ago, I was putzing around with them. Yeah. But, but uh, they, they, it, it certainly tunes slowly enough that you probably could do acceptable sideband uh, copy. Okay, where was I here? Oh, let's see. Oh, okay, the bottom line. We're getting there. So, no, no, 
Um, we'll, we'll be done. Let's see. We only got a couple pages here. We'll be done soon. I promise. With better shielding, better stability, and sensitivity and selectivity. Although, to be fair, I have not tried to measure these parameters. I'm not trying to compare pulse receivers to that level of detail. The AR radiate was better suited to critical surveillance work of, say, copying German and Enigma traffic and other applications where 24 by 7 stability and reliability was paramount. The 28 was a good receiver for point to point net applications where you knew about the frequency you were supposed to be on and you knew who you were dealing with. Some kind of network stuff. Uh, the, the, they, they got used in those, what were those trucks called with the, with the big transmitter? And, um, there was yeah, a, there was standard equipment. Yeah, the BC610, the big uh, helicopter. There was a truck that, 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 that came as like a complete uh, that, the, that the Army used. Um, let me see here. I'm, every time I add a lib, I lose my place, and then okay. it's um, it's unknown how many air radiates were, were made, but it's in the thousands, and most were exported. But in this part of the country, we're lucky. The apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, and I think part of that is because RCA used a lot of them internally for marine and, and, and ship to shore and whatever. They just sort of seem to they turn up in this area. I do have here a copy of this. Uh, RCA Trend Magazine from December 1976. And in 1976, AR-88s were still in commercial service 35 years after they were made. <laughs> Try that with your SX-28, or any other, to be fair, any other receiver of that era. Um, how crafters claim to have built, and variations, I should say this before I move on, variations of this were made into the 1950s. This is uh, the... CR-88 and CR-91, you can see it's got the, the extra knob there, and the gray front panel. Now, back to the 28, how the crafters claim they had built 50,000 the you were? That probably includes the A model, that's what I read. <coughs> the 28 was also available for a short time after the war. It was also a, a, a repackaged in an airborne form during the war called R-45 ARR-7. And there was a little known follow-up to that called the SX-32. It's cosmetically almost identical to that, but, but it lacks the base boost switch, the variable noise limiter, and the dial lock. Well, the dial lock is missing on, on this guy anyway. So if you were going to make a cost-reduced version of the SX-28, wouldn't you take out the um, fancy push-pull 66 audio? Allocrafters didn't do that. So, we're wrapping this up, I promise. The plot thickens. Let's take a few minutes and talk specifically about the two receivers I brought tonight. There's an interesting plot twist coming up regarding the AR-88. So we'll talk about the SX-28 first. This one, I'll turn it around so you can't see it, but this one was built for the military. It has the heavy-duty power transformer, and the filter choke and output transformer are dipped in black thaw. No, the output transformer is not. Nice. They're supposed to be dipped in black tar. It also has gear-driven band spread tuning. Most SX-28s have string drive, and it's usually broken. Um, someone has robbed the ID plate off the back, so I can't, I can't dig this receiver. Somebody apparently took it and used it uh, on maybe for a restoration. The S meter was also missing, and the meter that's in here is actually from an SX-25 part set that I got from the late Gary D'Amico. Um, there is a ABC issue because the S meter kind of just wanders around when you tune stations and doesn't really behave the way it should be. So the ABC in this needs some work. Also, strangely enough, the tone control has no effect. <laughs> that needs a little work. And now, now for the um, AR88. I had a kind of a WTF moment the other night while <laughs> carefully. Carefully looking over this radio, I was cruising the AM broadcast. But we're on the last page here, folks. Let's see. Nobody's left yet. Yeah, okay, one of us left. Okay. Uh, I was cruising the AM broadcast, and I was looking at the numbers on the dial, and I said, "Wait a second, that's not a production they are in any dial. It's sand letter. It looks sort of painted letter." This combined with the hand stamped tube numbers, although somebody forgot to. Uh, you can come up and take a look later. I forgot to stamp this, the numbers for the four tubes on the RF deck. 
combined with the hand stamp tube numbers on the, the, next to the sockets and the unlabeled terminals on the back panel. The back panel isn't labeled at all. And the lack of an ID plate. Doesn't look like it was removed like on that. All of that, plus some metalworking anomalies and uh, other things, lead me to believe that this is some kind of a pre-production prototype. It's either that or somebody wasn't there a country song where a guy built, what was it, a 57 Chevy uh, convertible? He brought it home piece by piece. Yeah. Somebody brought this whole piece by piece in his lunchbox. Now, how he got the front panel of the chassis and this huge, you should see the cabinet, at the home in his lunchbox, I don't know. But this was, there's some anomalies here that tell me this, is, this was not a production radio. This was, uh, where did it come from? The set was obtained at the June 11th J and D auction. It came from the Bob Paul reference. Oh, well, and now Bob did an excellent article on the ARA in the old on the AWA old times books. I have a copy of it here, although it's not dated. I can't tell you the month and year, but Bob uh, meant to figure and find that out and figure that out. He interviewed the, at the time 87-year-old designer of the uh, the electrical engineer who designed this, Lester Fowler was his name, who back in his earlier days designed a Radiola 18, which is a receiver I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, and the, the mechanical engineer was a man named George Blaker, because it's electrically and mechanically very sound. And this may be, perhaps this was Fowler's or Blaker's prototype, we'll, we'll never know. But uh, that's... Uh, and before we wrap this up, I wanted to talk about the, the, the AR-88's little brother. No, not the AR-77, which really is its predecessor, but the RCA BP-10. Most of you, I think, have seen these. And I think it's remarkable that the same manufacturer introduced these two radios about the same time, about like, circa 1940. Um, RCA had to develop um, battery tubes for this. Um, that was that was their development. They also had to source, develop or source a miniature speaker by the standards of the time. Miniature output transformer, miniature IF transformer. It's a tuning cap looks maybe a little smaller than your normal AA5. And the styling of the BP-10 foreshadowed uh, 1950s transistor radios that were made like two decades later, with, you know, thumb wheel knobs and things like that. Too. And it was available with an optional letter carrying case. As far as I know, no such option was available for the AR. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one last thing, Radio Boulevard. There's a site called Radio Boulevard. You'll learn more about these than... It's epic, as, as uh, Tom Provost has said, he, does, he thinks the, the guy who does the site, uh, he's out in Nevada somewhere, he doesn't sleep because it just goes on and on. You can go down a rabbit hole after a rabbit hole. It's amazing. So, so you can come up later and try it. That's, a, oh, that's about it. Yeah, they had the AR-88 LF, which I don't know if it was just the Canadians, but they wanted that they wanted to go from 75 kilohertz to 500, to about 450, whatever it was, four or something, and then they wanted to jump. In fact, this uh, CR-91, I think, is the same thing. And so they skipped most of the AM broadcast data, 75 to 550, and then 1.5 to 30. I think that's approximately what the AR-88 LF does. Um, and that's fine unless you want to do our DX contest and then kind of screw it. So, you know. So, what is your opinion as to which is the winner? Well, you know, I was, did that sort of I, clearly this is, this is the winner. But to be fair, you'd have to run them through a, a technical really. And, and to do that, you, you, you want two receivers that are in tip top shape. So, these would need to really be shaken out first. I mean, I can certainly do it now as is, but that's not entirely fair. Um, and I, I, you know. But that one was considerably more expensive. Oh, it was at least three times the price of that. Yeah. Yeah. I would say this, this that, that was 159 when it was introduced. The price climbed to $179, I think, pretty quickly. 
And this is well, it was, it, its predecessor was four hundred and ninety-five dollars. Now, I think the Arrow sixty was kind of overbuilt, but it's it's hard to believe this would have cost less than somewhere around five hundred bucks to build during the war. Can't say exactly because never seen any, and I've I've read about this, never seen any uh, ads, retail ads. John, that works out for just shy of eleven grand in today's world. What 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 year was your six four eight made, John? Uh, I think it was if they were both introduced in forty or forty one. Forty one. Yeah. Okay. And um, uh, and, and, was, and as I said, it was available. It was still available in forty six for a short time until they brought out the post war lines. Um, and I really enjoyed uh, listening to them. And this guy, as I said, there's. Some uh, differences. Oh, here's one. For example, at, at the cabinet, you look at any picture of an, of an AR-88. This guy has f four bolts here, 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 and here, and then he has a fifth bolt here. And the cabinet has this. This is this was built this way. This is not a hamification, but I've never seen a, it's a, a production another one with that with a the bolt there. I think they decided they didn't need. It wasn't getting them anything mechanically. So this is either real early production or it's, you know, something somebody had. Yeah, yeah, right. Now, where did I go? Where did they go for today? Good, good, uh, well, you know, Al, Al sent that, uh, that note around the guy in what, Connecticut somewhere. Right? Was so QRZ, right? He wanted 800 bucks for this. And it was in good shape. I think that was a good... And it, it, it looked very nice, although it was killing me. I said this on the reflector just for the fun of it. Nobody. Communicator. The, also on the communicator, I said. Um, he, somebody had added a crystal calibrator switch on the front panel, which was like, you know, why? Put it on the back, use, use a, an outboard crystal calibrator, don't mess up the front panel. Yeah. And it, was, it was well done, and it may have been done when the receiver was in commercial service. I don't know, but. I, uh, I, as soon as I looked at it, I saw it. this. This cost me two and a quarter at the J and D auction. So, like I said, it's the crazy crystal. What's this? What is that all about? It, it's the kind of I, I should have. I should have gotten the dictionary definition. Basically, it kind of tuned the crystal filter to separate okay. stations. I, I'll, I'll say something about that. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah the normal I. Uh, Filters are LC to the circuits. Well, now you come in there with a crystal, which has very high Q, and it gets you one state, one filter stage that's extremely sharp, sharp enough that on on CW Morse code you can with with, with BFO on it for Morse code you hear a signal here. You can also hear a signal. A thousand cycles on the other side. The crystal filter is sharp enough that you can not hear the other side of zero B. That was a, a standard part of high performance receivers back in the 30s. And I haven't looked for it, but apparently it does have a crystal face control, but it's fixed, it's inside. Yeah, it's fixed. So you, you just set it up. Uh, um, the, the, the phasing control, you can get really, really tricky, and you can null out. The guy on the other side by changing the face, and uh, or try to, or try, try to. Uh, <laughs> um, let's see. What did I forget to tell you? How long did that take, by the way? Oh, then uh, there was one of these. Of course, I think one of folks saw it for sale at the Sussex Hamfest, and I took a picture of it because it's beyond my budget. Oh, oh, I got to put a picture. Actually, so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, did that come up on the, on the That came up on the 
Like Dan said, that that company's still around and they, they did something different. Yeah, they're probably not working on these. No, I think, oh, by the way, John, your, your SX28 in today's money, $3,168. So $159? Yeah, it was a lot of receiver for the money. It wasn't as good as this. And, and, and I think I will at some point do a more technical, a more a deeper dive into, you know. But they, you know, how crap was this was a high end model for them. They were kind of all about more bang for the buck. And I should, I should mention, RCA never went back to the ham shortwave receiver market after the war. So they made some popular priced receivers before the war. After the war, they made all the commercial gear and they moved into, of course, DHF and UHF and other stuff like that. So. John, you said the RCA didn't have an AC line fuse. No. Doesn't have fuses any other part? Uh, not that I know of. Okay. Uh, and I, I looked at the manual last night just to make sure that that lack of a fuse was not a, just a, a one-off because this is a... Utterly fuseless. Apparently fuseless. Oh. Yes. Same, same thing. Same fuel. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, Margaret, that's... Uh, well, they figure out what figure. What? Well, maybe the speaker. Thank you. I knew I was going to forget. It. These are Halicrafters PM23s, to be exact. And they originally were designed for a, a receiver they made called the SX23, which was basically a failure. It was a little too fancy for their cosmetically fancy. But they kept the, they kept the receiver. It was one of those weird cases where the speaker was far more successful than the receiver. They, they made these speakers forever, and they they are contemporary with this. They were. It's the matching speaker for this. And, and, and this is a classic example of somebody gives you lemons, you make lemonade. This one had the output transformer has been robbed out with the matching transformer, actually. So it's low impedance only. So it's hooked up to the low impedance output of this. That one has a transformer, so it's hooked up to the high impedance output. But thanks, man. And the, the, uh, sometimes they had a pretty chrome H here for power practice. These are probably, were probably made for the military. They don't have the, the fancy chrome each. Uh, these fins, this matched the sides on the, um, the 20, SX23, 24, and 25. This kind of that stuff. Yeah. The ARA had sort of a generic. Yeah, it looks it looks to me. I, uh, let's see if I have it. I don't know where that is. It's in that manual, wherever that went. Um, sort of like a starburst. It wasn't too so it, it looks like an HQ120 speaker. Yeah. It's, it's the Rob's, Rob's got it. But yeah, it's, um, it was yeah, kind of a nondescript. Um, only ever saw one. I used to pretty. We had one, one turned up at um, the speaker. I mean, turned up at Parsifi. And I think uh, one of our members got it along with an ARA LF. Camera makes me nervous. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Well, stay with the camera. I already had to move the camera once. Oh, all right. Well, I wandered around. I checked on my phone and moved that way. There was a speaker. Oh, also, I, I, just for fun, I should mention that they ran these in a triple diversity configuration. Look at that. Three of them in a rack. This weighed about six million pounds. How do you explain what diversity was? Diversity, the idea is that the, you have this circuitry that picks out which receiver is receiving the signal strongest, and that's the one you supply to whatever you're... So you've got three antennas, probably at some angles to each other, and you've got three receivers. One of our members years ago acquired all this stuff and set one of these up. I won't mention any names. I don't want to embarrass anybody. He did uh, there, there, so the, this DR89 is three of these in a rack with the whatever they call it, the, the, uh, the comparator, the diversity. Combiner, I think is the word. The what? Combiner. Combiner, yeah. Okay. Com Combined, they weigh a lot. That's what I mean. That's what I think that's wrong. Anything else you want? Well, I'm going to sit on the monitor as a monitor. Yeah, and I, I, I'm not sure how popular this was. Um, I guess State Department, uh, MI5, uh, 0.5 microvolt. Uh, 
Diversity action. A difference of 4 dB in signal strength between channels at an average input of 1 point on microvolts causes diversity action to occur. I guess that means it switches to whichever one it is. Period. Uh, yeah, it, there's, there actually is a terminal on the back. Um, and some of them, some air radiates have a control over here exactly what that does for the diversity. I'm, I'm not sure. I think this, yeah, this has a little knob down here. That's, but yeah, the, I, I imagine they're, they're looking at the ABC. And, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, those are double A's for bias. No, these, these are electrolytic capacitors in the, uh, in the uh, as I said before, the um, reverb tank configuration. See, they, that needs to be, uh, the, the originals were, were the twist locks, but they were clamped in the, they look like D you know, battery holes. Oh, yeah. this thing's not turned on. <laughs> oh, also, here's, this is the kind of stuff we find. Your problem, what's this red wire do? I wanted the same thing, so I disconnected it. And I was greeted with a hum from the speaker, and the thing didn't power up. And I'm like, holy, don't tell me somebody's got one side of the line going to the chassis. No, fortunately not. It actually was powering up, but only the rectifier tube was. Somebody cut a, a ground lug here, I don't know why, where it broke. That's the main return for the, the heater string, or the filament string. So you, you did disconnect this, none of the tubes light, except for the rectifier. Yeah. So I had to put that, I, I will make this better. And, uh, so that's, that's, that's the kind of thing you find when you, you It's about an hour and a half. No, that's <laughs> no. Well, John, you did a great job. We really appreciate it. Have another round of applause. <laughs>
like we have a triple signal generator, model 34 and 35, sweep generator rather. Really interesting tuning dial. Interesting generator. Five bucks on the generator. Five dollars anywhere. Five dollars on the generator. Five bucks on the generator. How much? Two dollars on the generator. Two dollars on the signal generator. For it. Do I have two looking for three? Two looking for three. Two looking for three. Two going once. Two going twice. Sold for two dollars. Really nice little zenith. Little flip up zenith here. Nice little zenith. Not in bad shape. Very minor crack on the top of the door. A little hairline there. Otherwise, it looks really nice. Very nice little portal. The handle's not damaged. Very nice little zenith. How about ten dollars on the little zenith? Ten dollars on the zenith. Ten on the zenith. Five on the zenith. Five dollars on the zenith. What five I got? Five now six. Five now six. Six I got. Six now seven. Six now seven. Six now seven. Six now seven. Six dollars going once. Six dollars going twice. Six dollars sold. Bills a cast. <laughs> Okay, we have a Noma. Very interesting. I've seen Noma Christmas lights. I've seen Noma snow blowers. MTDs. I've never seen a Noma radio. Five dollars on the Noma. I'll be five dollars. Five. That's okay. Uh, five. I'll be six. Seven. Eight. Nine. I'll be nine. Nine looking for ten. Ten. I'll be, I'll be 11. 11 looking for 12. Uh, 12. 12. Alright. 11 going once. 11 going twice. 11 sold to me. <laughs> See if it's as difficult as your snowblowers. Uh, Alright, we have Firestone. Firestone. You get tired of it, you can tire it. You know, it's a Firestone radio here. Firestone tweed radio. Tweed portable. Not too bad. Nice Firestone tweed. How about five dollars on the Firestone? Five dollars anywhere? Five on the Firestone. Three dollars on the Firestone. Three dollars on a tweed portable? Three I got. Three now four. Three now four. Three I got. Three now four. Three dollars going once. Three dollars going twice. Three dollars sold the bar. Okay, we have a beautiful Reeb synchrophase here. Very nice Reeb synchrophase. A little bit of damage from the wood on the front, but it's got all of its well, it's got almost all of its two. It's missing one two. It should be. 5 2 green, it's actually a 6 2. It's even got a gold getter, a 1A in there. Nice green. How about $20 on the green? $20 anywhere? $20 on the green? Really nice radio, very clean inside. $20 on the green? $10 on the green. 10 I have now 15. 10 looking for 15. 10 to 15 I have now 20. 15 looking for 20. 15 looking for 20. 20 I have now 25. 20 now 25. 20 now 25 now 30. 25 now 30. 25 now 30. 25 looking for 30. 25 I'm looking for 30. A very nice three. 25 going once. 25 going twice. 25 sold the jump. We have a Howlcrafters S. 40. S40. Looks like somebody redid the speaker drill. Looks like somebody put a new. That's factory. Is it? No. No, I don't think so. New album transformer. New speaker, too. Halocrat, which leads me to believe, has the cord Is the cord look new? I wonder if it's working. Alright, Holocrafters S40. 20 on the S40. $20 anywhere. 20 on the S40. Looking for 20 on the S40. 15 on the S40. 15 on the Holocrafters. 15, 10 on the Holocrafters. 10 I have. 10 now 15. 10 now 15.
15, 10 now 12, how about 12? 10 now 12, and now 12 I have now 15, 12 now 15, 15 I have, 15 now 17, 15 now 17, 15 now 17, 15 looking through 17, 15 going once, 15 going twice, 15 sold to Ray Chase. Who do we have, is that an apex or something? Stuart Warner Cathedral. Bobby Stuart Warner Cathedral in Houston. Very nice to Warner. Looks pretty clean. A little bit of damage on the bottom. Very nice to Warner. That looks nice. How about 25 on the Stuart Warner? 25 on the Stuart Warner. 20 on the Stuart Warner. 20 anywhere. Nice to radio. On 15 on the Stuart Warner. 15 I have. 15 now 17. 15 now 17. 17 I have now 20. 17 now 20 I have now 22. 15. 20 now 22. 22. 25, 25 now 30, 25 now 30, 25 now 30, 30 I have now 35, 30 I have now 35, 30 looking for 35, 35 I have now 40, 35 I have now 40, 35 I have now 40, 40 I have now 45, 40 now 45, 40 looking for 45, 40 looking for 45, 40 going once, 40 going twice, 40 sold to fill. What do we have? We have a precision signal generator. It looks like it's lost some of its precision over the years. Precision signal generator. Well known signal generator. Five dollars on a precision, five dollars anywhere. Five bucks on a generator, two dollars on a signal generator, two dollars anywhere. Two dollars on a generator, dollar on a generator. Dollar I got a dollar I have now two. Dollar now two, dollar looking for two. Dollar going once. Dollar going twice, dollar sold to Leo. Okay, we have that beautiful fresh new masterpiece on the end. Does it have all its tunes? Looks like there's five on it. It has all of its, you all shoulder on one end, right? Yeah. It has five shoulder on one end, it has a built in wood speaker, yeah? Yep. Freshman masterpiece with a built in speaker, wood looks good too. How about 20 on the freshman? 20 on the freshman. 20 and a half. 20 now 25. 20 now 25. 20 looking for 25. 25 now 30. 25 now 30. 30 what's that? 30 and a half. 30 looking for 35. 30 looking for 35 on the freshman. 30 going once. 30 going twice. 30 sold. Thanks again for coming, we'll see you next time.